Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hansen. Um, it's always a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I want to start off by commending my honourable friend, the member for Warrington North, for opening this debate. And also to commend her for um, sum summarising um, comprehensively some of the issues facing the Rohingya people and what uh, we need to do, what our government needs to do. Uh, and, uh, and also to thank um, my co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on uh, democracy in Burma, uh, the member for Sutton and Cheem, for his contribution. Uh, we have work been working closely together to try and make sure that our government provides um, support uh, in relation to the uh, refugee crisis and also to make representations um, at the international level for more concerted action. Uh, and um, the minister, of course, started his brief in the week uh, within days um, of the, uh, 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 the attacks that led to some over 600,000 people being displaced. So uh, I'm grateful to the minister for giving, um, folk, giving uh, time and effort to make sure that our government's response, government's response is uh, stepped up. Uh, and certainly since he's been in position, he has taken much more time, uh, no disrespect to his predecessors, but much more time and given much more time uh, in this house to report to and work with us to continue to highlight the plight uh, of the Rohingya people who've been displaced internally but also uh, into Bangladesh. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, as the co-chair of the All Party Group, um, I've been aware uh, uh, for years of the systematic mistreatment, discrimination uh, of, uh, of the Rohingya people uh, and what they've endured for decades. One of the first, um, first things that I came across in 2010 when I got elected was representation from uh, local campaigners in my constituency who set up a campaign group to highlight the persecution of the Rohingya population uh, in, inside Myanmar, inside Rakhine State. And also many campaigning organizations from Burma Campaign to Human Rights Watch to Refugees International, Oxfam and, and others who have campaigned for years to highlight the treatment of the Rohingya population but also other minorities in Myanmar ahead of the transition towards um, towards democracy and the thing that they warned us of is that in the rush to uh, see the transition towards democracy which we all of course want wanted to see uh, that our government and the international community does not uh, remove all the sanctions uh, outright and ends up with little leverage over the what was going to, uh, and everybody knew this, uh, going to still be uh, a government the way in which the Burmese military had a strong hand in and dominance in. Um, but sadly, that warning went unheeded. Um, but the thing that we found as campaigners across the House working together was that this issue had taken too long for our government and other governments to take on board seriously, to make representation, to prevent what continued to happen both in 2013 and also last year when uh, in total, the combined total is now a million people being displaced, um, seeking refuge in Bangladesh. So it is not that our government and other governments could not see what was coming, it's that they were too, uh, too slow to see the warning signs, to listen to organizations working on the ground, trying to ensure that we took those warnings seriously. Uh, so it is, it is deeply saddening that it takes a genocide, it takes ethnic cleansing of the scale that we've seen before we see our government step up to the plate and take an international leadership role. And as I say, Mr. Chairman, while I am grateful, and like my uh, colleague, uh, my honorable friend, that our government has given international aid to help those who have been displaced internally and um, into Bangladesh, uh, we need to do much more. And we need to make sure that this crisis is not forgotten. Of course, in the context of the refugee crisis, 
the, the crises that have been um, that face millions of people around the world. Uh, not least in relation to the Syrian crisis, we have uh, a million people, over a million people in Lebanon, over a million people in Turkey, uh, also in Jordan, places that I've visited. Um, we know that the international community is under huge pressure. And our government has historically had a proud record of leading the way and making sure that we support the efforts of countries who are having to host refugees. For those countries, which includes Bangladesh, and we've heard already what a developing country, emerging economy with some of the highest levels of poverty in the world that requires support from our aid budget, is having to host a million refugees, um, which, which is of a scale that is unimaginable, that our country would struggle to cope with, Europe struggled to cope with. And yet these countries, whether it's Bangladesh or Lebanon or, or, or um, Turkey or Jordan, um, are having to do that. So it is right that we continue to support our aid budget. We um, resist the temptation to succumb to certain wings of the British media that are trying to undermine yeah. our aid efforts. Because if we didn't do that, our capacity to cope, to help these countries cope with um, the refugee crises um, would be even more limited. And it is right that our government, I'll give way. I say I wholeheartedly agree uh, with what she has to say about the aid budget. I think it is also very important uh, that we recognize not all uh, projects that we will give aid to will necessarily uh, provide full value, whatever, that may or may not mean. There's inevitably risk involved in any aid package, and I think we need to recognize, not that it is a business, it isn't a business, but we need to recognize that, in a sense, aspects of the business world also apply to aid. In, in other words, sometimes politicians need to take risks on these matters, and we should not... Uh, I mean, I have no problem about standing up here, and would have no problem about standing up in the House to say there are risks that we will take and that some, some of that... Uh, aid money will not bring quite derived benefits that we would necessarily have hoped for at the outset. But that shouldn't dissuade us from doing the right thing. Um, I, uh, I am grateful for that intervention from the Minister and I hope that other Ministers, particularly in, in DFID, will be, um, be absolutely confident and resolute in defending the aid budget because uh, it, it saves lives. Our contribution say, has saved millions of lives and lifted millions of people out of poverty uh, and helped in post-conflict uh, in post-conflict um, societies uh, and help those countries grow into economies that are now thriving. I give way to my honourable friend. I, I thank you, honourable friend. Uh, I mean, I hear what you are saying, but to me, listening to this debate on particularly the aid idea of the amount we are giving. I always find it troubling, actually, that the world's refugees, more than 80%, the burden is actually being carried by the developing countries. I think, never mind what we're doing, I think we should be thinking what more we can do. Would you yeah. agree with that? Of course, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to come on, come on to that uh, and on what role our government can continue to play uh, because although our government has been generous in uh, the um, contributions, uh, we need to see that happen um, when, with regard to other countries because uh, the total budget that's required to support just the, those affected in Bangladesh, the one million in Bangladesh, is around a billion uh, dollars. Um, so, so the cost is huge and we cannot expect a developing country to cope with the, the, the cost of that. There needs to be support at the international level um, and I hope that Britain will continue to play an international leadership role to make sure that happens. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, others have already spoken about the important role that the people of Bangladesh and the government has played in hosting uh, those who've been forced um, out of their country, out of Myanmar and into Bangladesh in appalling circumstances. Uh, and uh, that is now close to a million. Over 600,000 were displaced um, uh, last September and hundreds of thousands had been displaced previously under previous attacks led by the Burmese military. Um, and 
Uh, I want to echo the point that the Honourable Member for Sutton and Cheam made, made about the uh, response of the Bangladeshi population. I am of Bangladeshi heritage uh, and I am aware, acutely aware of the, um, the fact that the, the, the public reaction, uh, the reason it has been positive is because they have experienced, direct experience of facing uh, seeking refuge in India during the Second 71 um, War of Independence, as well as many being internally displaced. Uh, and I know many uh, of my constituents in the UK also, and across the country here, in other members' constituencies as well, um, raise money to help because that connection is, uh, is well felt. But of course, um, this is not a sustainable situation for an emerging economy for a, a, a country that has high levels of poverty itself. And that's why it's so important on the humanitarian side that we step up and we take urgent action. Um, as, as other members have already pointed out, the rainy season, the monsoon season is imminent. Uh, and this is a country, Mr. Chairman, even leaving aside the refugee crisis, this is a country that often faces huge floods where half the country, sometimes two-thirds of the country, is underwater. And it copes relatively well, but it's not able to cope with a million refugees who are not in decent accommodation uh, and where the systems are not geared up to cope. So the international community needs to work hard to make sure that the government of Bangladesh is open to support open to providing support from in international NGOs as well as domestic ones to scale up the support that's urgently required. Um, and that in return, it also gets the assistance, the humanitarian assistance and funding that's required. Because the, the, the it situation is urgent. Lives will be lost. There'll be a double catastrophe if we do not take action quickly to make sure that the government of Bangladesh with the support of international partners is prepared for the monsoon season. And therefore, this week, as we are hosting the Commonwealth Heads of Government Conference, and given that Bangladesh, although Burma isn't, Bangladesh is a Commonwealth member, and other countries in that region have a vested interest in solving this crisis, uh, in making sure that um, the, the situation doesn't get worse, I hope the Minister can explain to us what representation our government will make and what our government will, will do to facilitate discussion, not just with Bangladesh, the head of, he, head of government, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, but other governments um, from Chogham who can help facilitate and achieve a result that is more uh, positive than where we are now. A giveaway. Uh, would she also agree with me that uh, uh, the Commonwealth uh, Heads of Government is really, really important, but also more we can do with ASEAN countries, Burma's direct neighbours, would be, uh, they could play a really key role as well in trying to unlock the situation then? I, I couldn't agree more, um, and, I, and I hope the Minister will be able to answer um, to us on some of the discussions that he's had and the Foreign Secretary's had, uh, if, he has, if he has done, um, to explain what... Uh, results have, um, what, what sort of uh, discussions have happened, but also what the outcomes of those discussions have been. And I hope that the Minister will also explain what practical outcomes he has, um, he and his uh, fellow Ministers have got from the European Council. Um, he did report back to the all-party group, uh, but some of, the, some of the things that have been reported back um, were not uh, it were, were disappointing. So I hope that since that discussion, he might have continued to persevere uh, and he might have something more positive to say to us, particularly in relation to um, arms, the arms embargo. I'm aware that uh, our government, uh, although we have an EU arms embargo, our government hasn't pushed the international, for an international um, UN-mandated arms embargo. And I hope that the minister can explain why not and what he will do to try and get an international agreement because it's still the case that a number of countries are continuing to sell arms to the Burmese government. China, Russia, India, 
um, Ukraine and until the end of last year, Israel. Um, and some reports that they continued to sell arms um, even during that period when the, uh, uh, the attacks happened that displaced so many people. Uh, so I hope that the minister recognizes the urgency of the need to, uh, br to prevent the sale of arms um, where there's a direct relationship between a military that does not respect human rights despite the transition to democracy, albeit imperfect, um, and yet the international community continues to allow for, uh, for arms to be sold. Um, Mr. Chairman, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights described what is happening to the Rohingya people as a military campaign in which you cannot rule out the possibility that acts of genocide have been committed. The team from the UN stated that brutal attacks against the Rohingya have been well organized, coordinated and systematic and they further state that the violence perpetrated by the Burmese military has been carried out with the intent of not only driving the population out of Myanmar but preventing them from returning to their homes. And a report from the UNHCR from February 2017 detailed the serious human rights violations committed by Burmese, Burma's security forces including mass gang rape, killings, including of babies and young children, brutal beatings and disappearances. The UN, High Commission, the UN Human Rights High, Commission Zedi, uh, High Commissioner um, Zedi said the devastating cruelty to which these Rohingya children have been subjected to is unbearable. What kind of hatred could make a man stab a baby crying out for his mother's milk and for the mother to witness his murder while she is being gang raped by the very security forces who should be protecting her? We need to arrest and prosecute not just those who perpetrated this horrific violence, but also those who gave the orders. It is encouraging, Mr. Chairman, that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Fatou Ben Souda, has asked for a ruling on whether the mass deportations constitute a crime against humanity. The International Criminal Court should, in my view, rule in favor of an investigation and begin proceedings, and I call on the UK government to do all it can for this to happen. I hope the minister will address this particular point in a recent the recent development around the forced uh, e exclusion, deportation of the Rohingya population into Bangladesh. Um, we must also, uh, as I stated earlier, make sure that the government, the Burmese military government, is put under significant pressure, uh, both in terms of uh, 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 sanctions on um, on the military, but also economic, targeted economic sanctions on their interests. And as I said, a UN mandated arms embargo. And I hope that the minister uh, will, will heed the warnings of over 100, uh, over 100 parliamentarians when we wrote to the foreign secretary to call on the UK government to make a referral to the International Criminal Court. And while I recognize what he said, about the fact that because Burma is not a signatory that they need to self-refer. I think the act of, and other countries have done so, the act of making a refer referral, given the UK's position and given the UK's historic and unique responsibility to Myanmar as a former colonial power, um, that we have a leadership role and we should hold the Burmese military to account. Uh, to hold them up to account for committing uh, crimes against humanity, committing, potentially committing, um, uh, well, certainly committing ethnic cleansing and genocide, according to the United Nations. And so what I, what I appeal to the minister to do is to continue the effort to make sure that the international that the Burmese military are held to account and that the International Criminal Court referral takes place in whichever way is possible. Uh, and it's not good enough, frankly, to revert to saying it's not possible for these reasons. I want to know how the minister's going to make it possible because what we know is that when the Burmese military are put under pressure, uh, as we did with that correspondence to our foreign secretary, to our government for a referral and other governments and the negative publicity, and um, uh, uh, to, to ensure actions taken. That is when they finally feel the heat and actually uh, um, take to, to start to pay attention. So I hope the government will start 
to take action on these grounds, to hold the Burmese military to account. Because otherwise, once again, the international community, including our government, will allow them to get away with ethnic cleansing and genocide. And that is not acceptable. Thank you.